There it is. It's when okay. she was a little tiny girl, her dear mother would take her to the abortion mill there in Buffalo. Great, thank you very much. She thought it was great, but she loved it. Okay. What's your cord? So okay. Siobhan is remarkable. What's your cord? Step over the cord. I want to show you something. Uh, okay. From the time she okay, was in first all grade right. all the way through the buttons, 12 control. Years. And then oh. she went to prison. Oh, on the side right. there. Okay, right here. Okay, okay perfect. Nice thank you. See, up in front for you, Kevin. Excuse me. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and then she got her degree in history there at Christendom, wonderful school. She graduated magna cum laude. And she was very active in pro-life. She was active in pro-life since her infancy, but she became even more active in her years there at Christendom. Uh, they went on a regular basis to Planned Parenthood in downtown Washington. Now, that's a pretty good trek to go all the way from Front Royal to downtown Washington, but she did that. So she was the real spark plug in the pro-life group there at Christendom. Now, after she graduated, she, President Tim O'Donnell, this is another Tim, Timothy, this is a good Timothy, uh, liked her so much, he asked her to be his executive assistant for three years. And it well, wasn't three years then, but she stayed three years and became his alter ego and did great work there for Christendom, which he loves very much. And then she discerned that the good Lord wanted her to check out the uh, Dominican Sisters of Nashville. What local school did the Dominican Sisters of Nashville staff? Can anybody can tell me? Yeah, it's yeah right. Yeah. It's, the only, yeah. it's the only really Catholic school we have. Yeah. Catholic uh, <laughs> But anyway, that's a wonderful order. Oh, yeah. um, and, but after three years of joyful years, she just discerned the good Lord had something else for her. So she goes back to her home in Buffalo, gets a master's degree in childhood education, thinking she wanted to teach. For some reason, she had a teaching assignment. She can answer that question why she couldn't. But anyway, pretty soon she gets her dream job. And her dream job was being the executive assistant to Bishop Richard Malone. I met him one time, by the way, uh, when he was a bishop of Portland, Maine. And she loved it. I mean, she did everything for him. She just admired him. There was a pilgrimage all the way to Ireland. But then bad things started to happen. And that's what we're talking about. But when bad things happen, as good lay Catholics, we must rise up and do the right thing. Please welcome all the way from Buffalo, New York, Siobhan O'Connor. Thank you very much, Jack, and thank you all for being here today. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I'll try to raise my voice a little bit. Um, let me know if I start to talk too softly or too quickly. Um, but it's really an honor to be with you here, but I'm here because of what we know is going on within our church, which is a very difficult situation. It's really very tragic. So I'd like to begin with a prayer, especially for all victims of clerical sexual abuse, for our church, for her leaders, for her priests, and for all of us lay people. And we especially seek Our Lady's intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All right, so as Jack mentioned, I was very blessed to be born, not just in Buffalo, which I'll show you here. This is Buffalo, and... Um, it's great to be down here in this part of the country because you have spring, and it's a very beautiful season. Um, back home, we're having second winter, and that's what we have instead of spring. <laughs> um, but these are just some scenes from my hometown. I was very blessed to be born there. It's a great place. But even more importantly, I was very blessed to be born to my parents. They had waited eight years to have children, and they didn't know if they would be able to experience the gift of children. And during that time, they devoted themselves full-time to the pro-life movement. And in 1978, my dad ran for Congress, and this is the button that he had at the time. Um, my mom drew the little baby in the womb there. And um, he may not have gotten too many votes, but he definitely had a wonderful platform for the pro-life movement. And especially at that time, that was really critical. And a lot of people entered the pro-life movement after hearing him speak at various events and on television. And my parents were also influential in starting the Right to Life Party, which was a political party in New York State, the only one of its kind where it really the, the only purpose for this political party was to further the pro-life movement. So I'm very proud of my parents. I'm very grateful to them. That's my mom and my nana. 
I was very close to my Nana. And uh, you can see the resemblance there between my mom and my Nana. Not so much with myself. I look more like my dad's side. But there's that <laughs> the wonderful wagon. Um, I was younger when I was being uh, drawn along behind my mom. But I really did love those early pro-life experiences that I had. <clears throat> and when people will say in a critical way, they'll say, why do pro-life people bring children to a prayer vigil or to any kind of witness outside of Planned Parenthood or an abortuary? But having been one of those children, I know that it's a very natural experience. Children are naturally and powerfully pro-life, not just the witness they give by their lives, but because to a child's mind, of course it's a baby in that woman's tummy. They have a very natural and, and beautiful pro-life expression. So I really encourage that because I loved it from my vantage point in the wagon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then this is um, our homeschool classroom when we were little. And then we were very fortunate to have my brother join us. And so there were three of us when initially my parents had been told perhaps there would be no children. So very deeply grateful for my life and for my siblings. And this is what we look like now. And these are just a few photos from my youth, especially with regards to my pro-life work. So my homeschool group was called the Children of Mary, but our youth group was the Soldiers of Christ. And our patroness was St. Joan of Arc, and we had those very, very memorable red shirts. So much so that people forgot what our name was and just called us the Red Shirt Kids. Mm -hmm. And we were really focused on pro-life work. Here we are providing the music for a mass that begins the Rosary Novena for Life that happens in our diocese. It happens from February to November every year. And traditionally it was held at a church that was within walking distance of the abortuary, the primary one in our area. So we would play the music for the mass and then we would carry the banner as we processed to the abortion clinic. This is the primary abortion facility within Buffalo. It's called Women's Services. And um, you can't quite see it there, but on that sign, that awning says Birthing Center of Buffalo. Well, it did. <laughs> Here it is. Um, see, even the screen doesn't like abortion. Um, but um, it's very bizarre, and one of the only that I know of in this country, where there is a birthing center directly housed within an abortion clinic. And, of course, it's very odd because we're all there assembled in front, protesting prayerfully, and patients will come in, they get to come into the front if they're having a baby, but they're ushered directly into the back if they're having an abortion. And it really says all you need to know about what they're doing here, that some patients are given normal treatment, come in the front door, and the others are, are rushed in the back. And then this is just our group praying, um, oh, went too fast there, uh, praying in front of, oh, actually across the street because there's so many of us at the time. This was another type of service project that our youth group and homeschool group would do where we would plant the crosses in commemoration of all the lives lost. And then here we are at the March for Life. And I wanted to show you this picture because this would have been my junior year of high school. And this was Bishop Edward Head, now deceased. He was bishop for many decades. And then he was succeeded by Bishop Mansell, who was the bishop during my middle school and high school years. And of course, at the time this photo was taken, I was a junior, and I looked up to these men, not just because they were both very tall, but because they were our bishops, and I respected and loved them. But I would learn things later about how they were involved in some of the decisions that we are still dealing with and the cover-up that we're trying to deal with. Uh, and this was a picture my mom found of me receiving a, a Respect Life Award from Bishop Mansell. So again, just showing that connection that I had to these bishops. Here, this is a photo of my high school graduation from homeschooling, and the priest there who's blessing us, I would later learn when I started working at the chancery, was one of the priests who had been credibly accused of abuse. Um, and again, I just show this to, to let you know how there was that personal connection between myself and these bishops and these priests, just by virtue of being a, a student and a child of my diocese. So then this brings us to my time with Bishop Malone, which began in July of 2015. And I was really grateful to have this opportunity. I couldn't believe it. It just happened so providentially, the way that I was made aware of this opportunity, and then how quickly it worked out that I was accepted for that role. But I do remember that when I started at the Catholic Center, there was a lot of talk amongst some of the staff that I had come from the outside, and I was kind of an unknown. And I thought that was a little bit strange, but I later learned that the woman who had had the job, one person behind me, she had had the job for 40 years. She had been there for four bishops. 
And then there was a girl that came up from the tribunal and was there for a year. And then I showed up kind of out of nowhere. So I was this unknown. And I really think that that was a providential thing that I did come from outside because I came in with all of this optimism and I had my rose colored glasses on and I just thought everything was great. Um, but I, I definitely had um, that outside perspective that I think was very helpful. But in 2015 and 16, life was great. I loved my job. I got to work not only with the bishop, but also with his right-hand man, Father Richard, and he is a priest from Poland originally. And he came to our country essentially as a missionary, because as we know, our country has now become mission territory. Amen. And uh, so the three of us worked very, very well together. We had lots of great experiences. I just want to share some of those photos with you to indicate the kind of rapport that I had with the bishop. This was at his 70th birthday party, which we managed to pull off as a surprise. I love surprises. And I was so excited that we were able to truly surprise him, as you can see in this photo. And then he's checking out the cake we had made for him, which had pictures of his uh, childhood on it. Uh, and then here's one from the next year in 2017. And the bishop's birthday landed the day that the St. Patrick's Day Parade was held in Buffalo. And so we recycled the happy birthday banner, and we had that out for him to see. And he stepped off the parade route to say hello. And then this is probably my favorite photo of the bishop and I. I had never served mass before, but they really needed someone for the chrism mass in 2016. And I said, well, okay, if you can show me the ropes, I'll do it. So Father Richard guided me through, and I was the bishop's mitre bearer. And really, that's how I think of my time with him before everything happened last year. I really was in humble, happy service to him. And I'm very grateful for that time I had with Bishop Malone. But I also mourn for how it turned out because I really thought maybe I would be like Millie. I knew I wouldn't be his assistant for 40 years, but I really did think that maybe this was what God wanted, that I would devote my life to serving the bishops of our diocese. And I had great respect and admiration for him. Um, we also had a great trip to Ireland that Jack mentioned. There was a diocesan pilgrimage in 2017, which was really wonderful. And then last year in January, I was given the Pro Vita Award um, which is given annually in our diocese for either a layperson, a clergy member, a youth, an organization, things of that nature. And I was very humbled to receive that, and it meant a lot receiving it from Bishop Malone. So now we turn to the end of February 2018. And at that time in the Chancery, which is located on this fourth floor here, this is the Catholic Center, and at that time we were preparing for this March 1st press conference that Bishop Malone was going to be holding. And he was going to be announcing a, recon a um, reconciliation and compensation program for victims of clerical abuse. And at that time, I knew that there were victims of sexual abuse by priests in our diocese, but I didn't really have a sense of the scope and the volume of it. And I also really wanted to trust Bishop Malone. He had come from Boston. He was an auxiliary bishop under Cardinal Law, and he was there during everything that happened in Boston. So in my mind, I was thinking, well, he, of all people, would know how to handle this, right? Because he was there when all of this erupted in Boston. And so I was really hopeful that this was going to be a good program for the victims. Well, it turns out two days before that press conference, on February 26th, this gentleman here in the green jacket, Michael Whalen, he had a press conference outside of the Catholic Center. And he came forward as a victim of abuse by a priest named Father Norb Orselitz from our diocese. And really this was a watershed moment for our diocese because no victim had come forward in this capacity before. And th that very night, one of the reporters went to Father Orselitz's home and Father Orselitz admitted that he had molested dozens of boys. He couldn't even put a figure on it and he didn't even remember Michael. But he said, well, sure, it could have been him. And so that really created a really intense environment for which the bishop now had to have this press conference. So much so that Bishop Malone was concerned that someone had leaked the information of the bishop's press conference because the timing seemed so startlingly close. Turns out it was just providence. I don't think it was coincidence. Um, but then on that Thursday, March 1st, Bishop Malone did introduce this IRCP, as we call it, by the acronym. And this is a program that is done has been done in many dioceses in New York State. I know there's others that are taking place in different parts of our country. They all kind of have their own specifics, but the general parameters of it are mostly the same. And the three things I wanted you to know about the one in Buffalo is that first and foremost, a victim had to have previously 
filed a claim of abuse with the diocese. So if you hadn't done that before March 1st, 2018, you were inherently ineligible to participate. Number two, for the purposes of this program in our diocese, a minor was defined as being 17 years or younger. In the Dallas Charter that the church here in the U.S. uses, it was 18 and below. And that really bothered me that they had dropped it by a year because, to be honest, I really don't think it should make a difference if a young man or woman is 19 or 12. If you're 17 and a half, does that mean it's not a big deal? It just bothered me that they had chosen this arbitrary number when I knew that there were many who had been abused at a little bit older of an age and were equally as damaged by it. Lastly, if a claimant chooses to accept the compensation that they're awarded, they would no longer be able to pursue litigation against the diocese, so they couldn't sue in the future. And to my mind, that was being done preemptively because all the dioceses of New York knew that there was legislation in Albany regarding the Child Victims Act, which would allow victims of sexual abuse in any institution, secular or religious, to sue the institution for the abuse that they suffered. So that was part of the uh, details of this program, that anyone who accepted it could no longer sue. Another aspect of that program was that there was a hotline established by which victims were encouraged to come forward, to call, and to make their abuse known, and to receive either an IRCP application or any therapy that could be provided. Now, I don't know about you, but when you call a hotline, you expect that you're going to speak to someone, right? Even if it's someone just saying, we'll get back to you, we're really backed up, but you would hear from someone. Well, unfortunately, that hotline rang to an abandoned office that was dialed into remotely by our victim assistance coordinator, who was located in an office an hour and a half south. So that poor woman was supposed to be providing these therapeutic conversations for victims, but she was always doing it after the fact. She was always having to catch up on these calls, and at one point she was 90 calls behind. Mm -hmm. And because of that backlog, which was not her fault, it was just the system was <coughs> inadequate, victims started to call me at the chancery. They wanted to reach out to the bishop's office. They wanted to know, for many of them, is this a real thing? Why am I not getting a call back? Is this some kind of hoax that you've established? And then they were saying, I do want to participate, but is it going to take forever to actually start this process? So they had a lot of questions, they were confused and concerned, and that's how I started speaking to victims. And I used the word victim because at the time, that's the language that we used. Now I call them survivors, but at the time, victim was the term we used. And I was really frustrated by what I was experiencing on behalf of the victims, but then I was also extremely impacted by the testimony of the victims. There's something so powerful and haunting about hearing grown men sobbing. These are men usually between the age of 52 and 64, and you could just feel, even over the phone waves, you could feel that immense trauma and loss that they had experienced, whether they were talking about something that happened to them when they were 7, 13, or 19. It didn't matter the age. They were speaking in such raw terms. And it was a privilege to speak with them, but it was also very painful because I didn't know what I could do. I just I wanted to help them, but even this system that was set up was not helping them. It was causing them frustration or confusion. So at the end of March, Bishop Malone had a press conference in the Catholic Center in the lobby, and I was observing it from the second floor where there was a, a, a window where you could look down on the proceedings. And this journalist named Charlie, he was a reporter for one of the local TV stations, he asked Bishop Malone, he said, you know, I've been hearing from victims that they're having to wait forever to get a call back, and I'm just wondering about that hotline of yours. And Bishop Malone said, oh yes, I've just been made aware of that within the past few days and we're, we're working on it. And I was shocked by that because I knew that Bishop Malone, I had made him aware of this when it first started happening in the beginning of the month. I had told him, gosh, there's this backlog, how are we going to help Jackie with these calls? He knew I was taking them because he was hearing me and seeing me on the phone. And so that was the first time I realized that he was saying something publicly that did not reflect the reality that I was witnessing. So I wrote to Charlie, as you can see in this email. It was an anonymous email. Basically, I just wanted to corroborate what I expected the victims were telling him, which was, we're not hearing back from this hotline. And this began the beginning of basically a sporadic email conversation with Charlie. It was usually based on if he had a question, if there was something that I could tell him. But it was pretty minor details that I was sharing at that point. 
And I did it because of the survivors and how much their testimonies had meant to me. So as you can imagine, there was a great outcry from the people of our diocese and from the people of the community because now they were hearing about this IRCP program, victims were coming forward inspired by Michael Whalen's press conference, and now there was this real demand for a list of the names of accused priests. And Bishop Malone even said that they would do this with a list because he wanted to have victims be empowered and liberated by seeing their abuser's name in print. So they began the process of developing this list. And I remember thinking, gosh, this is wonderful. He's, he, he understands how this must be for the survivors. And I, I was really hopeful that this might be a turning point for our diocese. Unfortunately, they released a list of 42 names. And I knew immediately that that was inadequate because there were names that were missing, names that I had heard from people on the phone, names that I'd seen in claims coming through for the IRCP. And I wasn't alone in questioning that. Now, I don't appreciate that this cartoon mocks the confessional, but I understand where the cartoonist is coming from because the people of our diocese and the community were saying, go on, as if to say, we know there are more. And unfortunately, that was the reaction across the board was that people thought there must be more because the Buffalo News had already figured out there were at least 59. So there was definitely skepticism surrounding that list even for people who weren't informed. But for myself, it was particularly devastating because I had seen their draft list of 117 names and I knew that they had established these two criteria by which they determined whether a priest would go on the list or not. So the criteria was that a priest had to have been removed from ministry, retired, or left ministry. That was category one. Or the priest was deceased with more than one accusation. If you think about it, that means that an active priest, by virtue of being an active priest, cannot be on that list. And they actually had descriptions to that effect accompanying the priest's names. So I bolded the ones I really wanted you to see. No, we would have to change the criteria to add him to the list. He is still functioning as a pastor and so should not be on the list. And then that middle one, we did not remove him from ministry despite full knowledge of the case repeated rape of a 15-year-old girl, so including him on list might require explanation. He does not fit criteria of either category. Wow. But they had created those categories, first of all, to make sure that the list was more digestible, because 42 is a lot better than over 100. And secondly, so that no active priest, so that they could say no priest who's actively ministering has ever been accused, when that was not true. And so it was particularly the case of that young girl, the 15-year-old girl, her name is Stephanie, and that's a picture of her on the left there when the abuse began. The picture in the middle is when her abuser gave her his Roman collar for her to wear for a Halloween costume. Mm -hmm. And that's him right there, Father Fabian Mariansky. And I had always thought he had such a cool name because he had the Blessed Mother's name and his last name. Mm -hmm. But you kind of wonder, how could a priest, you know, they, they even acknowledge in that, that accompanying text on his name that they were fully aware of this case. How in the world did it not have any repercussions for this priest? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the bishop you see below. That's Bishop Edward Grosch. That's our auxiliary bishop. He's a classmate of Father Fabian's, and he's also a very close friend. So much so that when the Buffalo News did a story on Stephanie's abuse, all of a sudden there's been no response from the diocese, but now there's a story in the Buffalo News, and the very next day Father Fabian's called in to be put on administrative leave so he can no longer minister. And that morning, all Bishop Grosch was saying was, Oh, poor Fabe. This is going to be so hard on him. And I thought, really? That's your reaction? It's so hard on him? It should be hard on him. He's gotten away with this for decades. He's been able to minister freely. There's a building named after him at one of his former parishes. It's not hard on him. It's time for it to be hard on him. But there was no thought of the victim. It was always, woe is me as the bishop, either Bishop Malone thinking, oh, I have to deal with this, or Bishop Grosch, oh, I have to put my friend on administrative leave. That was the the perspective. The compassion they wanted was towards themselves, not towards the victims. Incidentally, Stephanie has returned to the faith and for quite some time now and is a very faithful traditional Catholic. She even, she even uh, runs a Catholic store in her hometown. Uh, she's just a wonderful, wonderful person who has not abandoned the faith despite what she has endured. So now this brings us to the ordination in early June of last year, and they again had me serving. Um, but this time, 
they had a cape on us. There was a change in the um, sort of dress code for the miter bearer. Um, but I find this interesting because, of course, I didn't know I was being photographed at the time. But that expression on my face is sort of a bewildered exhaustion. And that's very much what I felt by early June. Because I had seen that draft list. I was hearing the victim's testimonies. I was aware of other cases that were not being handled properly. And I was so deeply saddened and, and let down by Bishop Malone. Even though I was there to be his miter bearer, I was still doing my job to the best of my ability. But I was feeling immense psychological and spiritual strain and stress. And it was actually exhibiting itself physically. I had a panic attack. I was having crying fits. I would, one time I was driving by a middle school, and there was an open house, and a bunch of middle school age boys were jovially running into the building. And I actually had to pull over and, and park the car because I was just overcome with emotion because those were, that's the age of most of the boys who were abused. So it was really affecting me psychologically. And I really felt that I was either going to lose my mind or lose my faith. And I felt that I, my faith is my, the greatest gift my parents gave to me. It's the greatest gift from God, my belief in him. And I didn't want what was going on in the leadership of my church to affect my belief in my faith and my love for my church. So I was definitely very frustrated by it. But this picture kind of makes me laugh because I didn't realize again that I was being photographed. But there I am in the side of the frame following the bishop in the procession. And so I call this watch your back. <laughs> um, but you don't know who's, who's watching you when you're, when you're making decisions that um, are ones you're going to regret. And I was watching Bishop Malone, but I also was trying to engage with him. I didn't do any of this without really trying to speak with him and let him know. I told him directly that I was feeling morally allergic to my job, that I was incredibly uncomfortable with how certain cases were being handled. He knew that I was really frustrated and really struggling, so much so that he told me, if it's becoming too much for you, perhaps it's time for you to move on. It was one particular case, though, that really caused me to decide that I needed to do something, and it's the case of Father Bob Yetter. These are some of the allegations against Father Bob. There are additional ones. But Father Bob was preying upon boys who were either eight, from 18 years old to about 25. And some of them had come to him because they had a really bad breakup with their girlfriend. Another was struggling with same-sex attraction. Another was going through some spiritual difficulties. So they were coming to him for counseling and support. And he would ply them with alcohol and then attempt to sexually assault them, and successfully did so in some cases. And these allegations had started to come in in 2017. And I became more aware of them in the spring of 2018, last year, when one of Father Yetter's victims actually came to meet with Bishop Malone. He was, this victim was a member of a youth group, a, a young adult group, and so Bishop Malone had a meeting with him, probably hoping to nip it in the bud and make sure that, that he could kind of set the story straight. And he told this victim, well, don't worry, Father Bob's going to be retiring this year. And I just could not let that happen. I felt this is not fair that this priest is going to be able to ride into the sunny sunset of a retirement just because the bishop doesn't treat these cases the same way. The bishop would say to me, well, it's not a charter case, Siobhan. We're handling it in a different way. But I'm really sorry. If my little brother was abused when he was 20, it wouldn't make any difference to me that he's 20 versus being 17 or 18, especially if he had been plied with alcohol beforehand. In addition, Father Bob Yetter was a very, very good fundraiser. His parish was the second most profitable in the diocese. It was a very large one, a very prominent one, and he'd been pastor there for 23 years. So it wouldn't look good for that kind of priest to suddenly leave. But you know what? The Catholic Church can't be so concerned about appearances. We can't have that our, our focus be on the PR of our HR decisions, and that unfortunately was the case. So that was June. Now we're getting into July. It was July 5th when this reporter, Charlie, whom I'd been communicating with somewhat randomly, Charlie reached out to the diocese and inquired about Father Bob. He happened to have heard some allegations of creepy behavior and just asked the question. He said, what's going on with, with Father Bob Yetter? And that simple query was enough to prompt Bishop Malone to finally send Father Bob to an assessment at Southdown, which is the institute in Toronto that the diocese uses. So multiple people have been encouraging this. Get him to an assessment. Pull him from ministry. The canon lawyer did. Even the diocesan review board did. I know I did. And it was a reporter from obviously outside the diocese, although a faithful Catholic, who actually 
succeeded in causing this action to take place. It had been almost a year of the bishop dragging his feet, placating people, and simply not wanting to move forward. And that's when I realized it had come to the point where I knew now that the only positive changes that were taking place were when there was some kind of external impetus, usually from the media or from a threat of law enforcement. It was one of those two. So I decided I've been communicating with Charlie anonymously. Now I want to do it as myself. I want to introduce myself to him. Turns out he actually beat me to it because he followed me home from work one day. Uh, apparently he wanted to talk to me as much as I wanted to talk to him. So we met in this parking lot. That's why he's standing in that picture. Um, and we ended up talking. We realized that all of the questions he had, or a lot of them, I had answers for. And that I also had documentation, which I had been saving without really a full understanding of what I would do with it. A lot of it was a sanity check. I saved the draft list because I couldn't believe what I was reading. I saved other things because I remember thinking, someday a grand jury should see this. So even when I wasn't fully aware of what I was going to do, I had that sense that I needed to document this to prove it because it was so unbelievable. So it was August 22nd that we put out the first report on these priests. And prior to that time, August 10th, I had left employment with Bishop Malone. I did get another job because I knew I would need to have something convincing for uh, my reason to depart the chancery. And uh, it was the Feast of the Queenship of Mary, and then this was the reading of the day from Ezekiel. And I couldn't believe how incredibly appropriate some of these lines were, and really the whole um, focus of this reading. But I just wanted to read the last lines here. Thus says the Lord God, I swear I am coming against these shepherds. I will claim them, <laughs> my sheep from them, and put a stop to their shepherding my sheep so that they may no longer pasture themselves. I will save my sheep that they may no longer be food for their mouths. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will look after and tend my sheep. And to me, that was really a sign of hope because I, I just was like, we are yours, Lord. We are your sheep and we need good shepherds. In many cases, we don't have them right now. But I just felt such immense hope that God was leading this whole process because I certainly couldn't have done it myself. I didn't know how to be a whistleblower. I didn't know how to do any of this. It was totally foreign to me, but I really trusted in God. I prayed desperately to him. My prayer became very simple. I just kept saying, God, help me. God, help me to do the right thing. And I felt such immense peace when this story came out. It was called Fall from Grace. Um, that's Father Bob Yetter on the left there. This is Father Art Smith. He's the other priest that we focused on. His story is equally disturbing, but just too detailed to go into now. But again, that was another case where Bishop Mullen had personally mishandled and made terrible judgment calls, including letting Father Art Smith, who had credible allegations against him, he approved him to minister on cruise ships. And the bishop's excuse was that he didn't think children would be on cruise ships. Um, so it was things like this that really made me feel like I, I can't even express the weight that lifted off of me. In fact, at one point I handed Charlie some documents and he said, are you okay? And I said, well, I am now. He said, because you, you were almost shaking as you handed them. And I said, I was because I, I know what I'm handing you. I'm handing you a very powerful truth. But I trusted him to tell it well, and he did. So the reaction from the people of our diocese and of our community was very immediate. People started calling for the bishop to resign, whether it was legislators, whether it was politicians. A deacon, Deacon Paul Snyder, came forward and called for the resignation. And to be honest, I was a little bit startled by that. I hadn't known what to expect. And I felt that I wanted to wait and see how would the bishop and the diocese respond. Because I felt as though I had, in some ways, I had forced them to now make a decision. Where were they going to go from here? Were they going to finally admit what they'd been doing and move in the right direction, or were they going to buckle down? Well, unfortunately, oh, sorry, real quick, I just love this one. This is Michael Whalen, the victim who first spoke out, and I loved his sign, Shuffle Out of Buffalo. <laughs> I thought that was really great. Um, but unfortunately, they went Fort Knox on the chancery. Within 48 hours of the stories being broadcast, they had installed biometric screening to get into the secret archives. As soon as the door opens, a recording device now goes on so that all activity is uh, recorded. And we're talking about a chancery that previously had been pretty, pretty low to mid-tech. I mean, we were just trying to make sure that people's password wasn't password. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a high-tech operation. And the secret archives had been somewhat in disarray even. So the fact that they had gone from zero to 60 in security to me really told the story 
sadly, that they were more worried about protecting what was in there than about being honest and acknowledging what had happened. So this cartoon I really thought was very appropriate, that it showed just where the focus was. Mm -hmm. Then that Sunday, Bishop Malone had a press conference. And that was really what I was waiting for. I wanted to hear from him. I had really reserved judgment as far as the resignation question was concerned. And of course, no one knew what I'd done, so they weren't asking me. It was just me personally wondering. And I was so hopeful that Bishop Malone would come forward and be humble and contrite and sincere with us. Because if we are his sheep, then all he had to do was to be honest and to set us on that road of truth. But this was one more opportunity that let, he let pass him by because he came forward and he was joking around at the beginning. He was acting like this was just a PR exercise. Every other sentence I could tell was written by the lawyers. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, he was speaking much more in the royal we than in the humble I. It was all about we the church and we, 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 we. And I just thought by the end of it, I was in tears. I was on my knees actually praying in front of the television. And by the end of it, I was in tears because I thought, oh, this was his chance. I really, I so wanted him to step up. And he could have been the hero here. It turned out that the survivors were the heroes, not me. Definitely not me. But he could have been. He could have been the one to, to really turn things around. And it, it grieved me greatly that he didn't do that. So then the next month, in September, 60 Minutes happened. Now, I never had that on the radar. I, I was just going day by day. But as it turns out, Deacon Paul Snyder, who's here, he had uh, come forward right after the stories first aired. He was the deacon to Father Bob Yetter, so he was particularly outraged by that whole situation. And he stepped forward and called for Bishop Mullen's resignation the next day. And CBS was looking through for a possible story on the Catholic Church, and they saw this news story about a deacon calling on a bishop to resign, and they thought that was noteworthy. So they reached out to Deacon Paul. And through Deacon Paul, they got to me. And it was a very interesting conversation with the producer because he was vetting me as a source, but I was vetting him as a media platform because it was very important to me that anything that 60 Minutes would do or CBS would not be attacking the church. I knew that there were problems within the leadership. I knew there were problems within our diocese, but the church herself is holy and sacred. And if they were going to use this situation to attack the church, or to attack our faith, then basically I would have said no documents for you because I just did not want that to happen. And so I was very careful with them. I said, well, there are problems here and I want them to be addressed and corrected, but it has to be done respectfully. And I was very grateful that they did abide by that. They were very respectful. The interviewer, Bill Whitaker, was wonderful. The production team was great. But looking at my face there, it really reminds me of how painful that experience was. People have accused me of wanting 15 minutes of fame, but it was really 15 minutes of pain. Um, it was very, very difficult to talk about these things. It was the first time I talked to people about it, really. It was an hour and a half long interview. It was very intense, and it was not something that I wanted to do. I felt that I had to. Father Bob Ziliax was also incredibly heroic. He's a canon lawyer who had been advising Bishop Lone for five years and trying to make headway with the secret archives and just the general chaos and nothing was ever done. Whenever Bishop Malone would listen to him, it was placating and, oh, sure, Bob, that sounds great, and then nothing would come of it. Father Bob is also a victim of one of the priests of our diocese. He was abused when he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So he's particularly heroic because he was able to come forward not only as a priest and a canon lawyer, but also as a survivor. So the fallout from 60 Minutes was pretty intense for me, certainly. I'm a natural introvert. I don't like... Uh, I'm, I'm behind the scenes all the way. I love that kind of thing, helping other people to go <laughs> on the stage, but not to be on it myself. So that was really difficult, but I did feel that it was important for people to know that the person who leaked those documents did so out of love for the church, not with animosity or vengeance in her heart. I thought that was really critical, and that was really the main reason why I agreed to do it. And this is just a tribute to Charlie. He's a faithful Catholic dad of three kids. He sends his kids to Catholic school. His brother's a seminarian for the Franciscans. He's really a stellar person, and yet the bishop constantly has tried to vilify him and attack him and demean his character simply because he hasn't let up on this story. But one of the most significant results of 60 Minutes, other than my being here and some other things that have happened, um, the thing that mattered the most to me was that the bishop finally had to address these allegations and now this 
this true scandal that was going on. And I couldn't believe the way they set it up, because for me, it looked like all the king's horses and all the king's men. <laughs> but even more so, it felt like the Wizard of Oz with the screen removed. Because now you saw how much the bishop was relying on these people. Very often when they, he would be asked a question, he would have to turn to the lawyers or get one of the lawyers to come up and respond. Or someone else would have to do it. And I remember thinking, gosh, this is really how this diocese is being run. There's such a focus on the legal and the financial. And it, it really just it reflected very poorly on Bishop Malone. But one positive thing that came out of that is that the bishop did reveal 36 new names. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Since March, they've been saying, oh, no, 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 they've been sticking with their list. And then a week after 60 Minutes, they give us 36 new names. Of course, they weren't new to Charlie and I because we'd seen all those names, but it was good that they were finally being held somewhat accountable. This picture here, to me, is the most important one of the bishop that's been taken lately because for me, it just it seems to reflect that he might be regretting how it came to this point. And I certainly join him in that regret because there were multiple times when he could have changed this narrative. He could have taken that heroic yet humble stance. And I, I can only imagine that there are times when he regrets that. Um, this was a photo from November when I was here for the USCCB event, um, which turned out to be kind of a non-meeting, a non-event. But one funny thing that happened was that I had that clean house sign and of course I'm standing before the Marriott and it was just kind of a funny thing because this gentleman was walking to work and he stops and he goes, oh, is the Marriott not up to health code? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh no, 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 sir. I said, I'm, I'm protesting the, the Catholic bishops. And he goes, well, are they not up to health code? And I said, well, no, <laughs> they're basically not. Um, so that was an interesting experience to see the bishops in their, in their collectivity and, and just how um, how they handled themselves and again it felt like they were CEOs of businesses not shepherds of sheep. This is a hopeful picture uh, collage that I want to end with here because I want to show you the, the great progress that Michael Whalen has made. Here he is in that green jacket from that first press conference last year then a few months later then on the bottom left last fall and then here he is just a few weeks ago, really, when the Child Victims Act was signed into law in Albany. And you can really see that he has just gained so much peace and so much joy. He would say that himself, and he said it publicly, that by really being able to forgive, he's actually forgiven his abuser. He wants to uh, actually meet with Father Orsolitz and, and express that to him personally. Um, and he, here's a man who knows that his abuser voluntarily admitted he'd abused dozens of boys and doesn't even remember him, but he's willing to forgive him. Um, and he's also been such a great proponent of our faith because he was raised in the Catholic faith. And he keeps telling people on social media and whenever he does a media uh, appearance, he will always say, the Catholic faith is beautiful. It is a beautiful faith. It's been perverted, but it itself, it is beautiful. And he's such a wonderful champion for our faith. And it was really such a great privilege but also overwhelming to meet him back in February. We decided to meet on the anniversary of his uh, press conference and we'd never met. We knew each other's faces so well by then of course but we hadn't actually met and it was really remarkable to be able to meet a hero in real life. I was overwhelmed by that and I'm also so grateful to him that he agreed to go to Mass with me that day because the place where he had the press conference was right outside of the Mother Church of our Diocese, St. Louis, a beautiful German Gothic church. And I said to him, well, Michael, if we're meeting there anyway, why don't we go to Mass? And so we did, and he told me that it was his first time going to Mass in 40 years. Wow. Um, and that was just, if it was powerful, moving, and healing for him, it certainly was for me. And I think for many of us in the diocese, it really was a sign of hope and just such a witness to what can happen when you do have a forgiving heart, which we, I think we all do want to have for the leaders of our church, too. We want them to admit what's gone wrong and to show us how they're going to make those corrections and to stop worrying about the PR of it and the optics of it and the finances of it. We don't want to hear any more about the procedures and the protocols. That's not what we're concerned about. And I feel like Michael is such a witness to what really needs to happen, which is a restoration of the church as we know she is. She is filled with truth and beauty, and he and his smile are such a remembrance of what can happen when you do embrace the hope and healing of Christ. So I just want to end with this, that, um, this one here, um, just something that I've been thinking about so much about how mm. our hope must be in Jesus and in his church, 
and how no matter what the powers of hell may seem to be doing, and they are certainly active these days, that we know he will never let them prevail over us. So keep up the good fight. We, the laity, are, I believe we are going to be the ones who lead the renewal of the church that we love. So thank you all for being here. Stand up. Isn't she fantastic, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what a blessing she is yeah. to the church. I said earlier, she's a modern day Joan of Arc. A modern day Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. How blessed we are. And thank you so much, Siobhan. Thank you, you Jack, for wonderful. having me. Now we'll have you back in a few minutes for some questions and answers. But now I would like to take a few free will offerings to defer the expenses of tonight's today's talks. So please be generous. Um, anything you give is tax deductible. If you'd like to write a check, make it payable to the pen light. And Kevin, could you make sure this basket is circulated? Thanks, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I can do this later, but I wanted to, to pass you down. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, hi, I'm Dr. Claire Merkel. Um, I have a ministry regarding the reform of the leadership of the church. You can see my website at onceafuturepriest.com. Here's a wonderful, wonderful prayer for the conversion of priests and bishops who have either abused children or, or allowed abuse. If you don't, um, they're free, so I'm, I'm just going to hand them out real quickly. Sure. Sorry. Um, I just want if Bishop ever reached out to you. No, I haven't spoken with him since August 21st of last okay. year. So mm -hmm. I pray that someday we might be reconciled, but not yet. Is he still bishop? He is, yes. Yes, he is. And he doesn't plan to go anywhere until 2021, which is when he would naturally retire due to age. And were there any repercussions against you at all? Did you? Well, I was really anxious about that. Initially, I, I somehow had conjured up this idea that I might go to jail. Um, even though I didn't believe I had committed a criminal act, I just thought maybe they would come up with some charge, and you just never know. Um, and then I was really mostly worried about any kind of legal action. I was worried that I would be destitute from lawsuits and... I, I really was worried about that. I thought they might defame my character or go after my family. So there were a lot of concerns, and I really wasn't sure what to expect. It turns out that they, they really didn't have much to go on because I hadn't committed a crime. Obviously, I violated the handbook of the diocese for employees, but, um, but that's not a criminal action. And um, then there was some talk at one point about the possibility of them going after me for petty larceny because I had stolen the ink and the paper and the electricity to make the copies. But I think they realized just how petty larceny that would be. <laughs> um, so that never actually ended up happening. So the, the biggest thing I'm facing right now is just trying to find my place back home because I wouldn't be able to speak like this to anyone from our diocese. Um, any pastor would be understandably concerned about having me. Um, I've become kind of a sign of controversy, which is unfortunate because I really don't think that I'm the controversy so much as perhaps that I made the controversy better known. Mm -hmm. And that's been hard to just to wrestle with where I'm going to fit in with the renewal that I want to be part of. So was there another question? Yeah. Um, first, I just want to make a comment. You're a very courageous woman. Oh, thank you. Amen. I'm grateful for what you did, inspired by the Holy Spirit, no doubt. It was him, yes, absolutely. Couldn't have done it without God every step of the way. I feel ignorant about what's happening within our own diocese here in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, anybody know what's going on in our own diocese? Are there any more folks being revealed? Because mm -hmm. I don't see too much written. Well, that's the, I can only speak from my experience. They don't want to have you know. They would much rather that you have the, the ignorance and the, in their case, they consider it to be blissful ignorance, but we know it's not. Um, so they're, and I think they're now increasingly concerned because of the federal probes that are going on. Um, just last week we found out that a federal grand jury has been impaneled for the Buffalo Diocese, and obviously that's a real contradiction because half of me thinks, oh my gosh, it's awful that the federal government has to come in and clean this up, but then half of me is relieved and grateful because then at least there'll be some accountability. But I would expect that here it's just even a, a greater number of, of um, potential things that they might be trying to hide from you all. And I can't, I can't say that with authority, but based on what I experienced, I don't think Buffalo was alone. 
in that. I'll, yeah. I could just say you can go online to bishopaccountability.org and they list all the priests in the Baltimore Archdiocese and mm -hmm. all the bishops and also, Church Milton is doing a good job yeah. of that. Michael mm -hmm. Warsh. Michael yeah. Warsh, yeah. yeah. He's uh, documenting the bishops coming mm -hmm. up. One example of, um, you want to call it a cover up, is Diane Libero, our wonderful editor of Defend Life, uh, who's now in her early 80s. She's either 80 or 81. Wow. And a great author, great writer. Um, she went to the Catholic Men's Conference a few Saturdays ago and wrote the the cover articles about the great speeches, the talks that were given. That's all in there. Mm -hmm. But if you go turn a few pages, you see uh, her little conversation with Archbishop Lori. So she said, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Diane the Barrow, defend my blah, blah, blah. She was the last one in the receiving line because she didn't want to create an embarrassing situation. She wanted to make it easy for him. Uh, what are your plans to do something uh, about Father? Joseph Muth, who's this gay lesbian priest. Now, he may not be a gay priest himself, but he's harboring, he's gay friendly, and he's harboring this gay lesbian group at St. Matthew's Church. And we went undercover a few years ago, and Diane went to one of the meetings, and he comes in and says, this is the best hour of my week, <laughs> come to be with you, you know, wonderful gay lesbian people. And what did Archbishop Lori do then? Nothing. And what did he do about a year later when Father Muth was marching in the gay lesbian parade? Nothing. And what is he doing now? He said, oh, I feel like I'm being ambushed. You know, please write me a letter for an appointment. Well, he won't meet with me. He won't meet with Diane. My sense is that we have a huge problem. And he's stonewalling us. So, and anyway, pray. Because our problem might be somewhat similar to Buffalo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who has the next question? Did you ever get um, comments from people, priests that have been falsely accused and asked to leave their parishes? Did they come to you for help or anything? No, they, they wouldn't have come to me just because by that time I would have been out of my role in the chancery. Um, I know that there have been a few cases where, um, j just so you have a, a sense of how the process goes, there are some cases where there's either mistaken identity or there might be the confusion of a victim based on the fact that they were abused when they were quite young. So for instance, one victim I did speak to, he knew that his abuser, the last name began with an S, he knew the time frame that the priest would have served at his parish, but he really had few other details because he was quite young, I think he was seven when he was abused. Um, so I went back into the archives and I checked and it turned out that there were three priests with a last name that started with S. And it was so difficult because that gentleman understandably wanted me to read the names. And I said, but I can't because that might make you think it's a name that it wasn't and then that would invalidate your, your claim. So there are cases where there is confusion. There are, have been victims who have come forward and said, I want to clarify that that priest that was implicated, he didn't abuse me. So most of the time, from my experience, the victims were eager to make sure that they were, were proving the abuse had taken place. And it's only 0.4% of claims in this category of clerical sexual abuse that are false. Um, that's not to say that a false claim is, is not something to be concerned about. Obviously, that's a tragedy of its own. Um, but I'm not familiar with any priests. Most of them, sadly, they would accept being removed because they didn't have anything they could say in their own defense, which is really sad. But, but I do think it's important to defend and support are good priests um, who are understandably under a cloud of suspicion now. So, did you have a question? Um, I was wondering what happened to the reporter. Is he still a reporter? He, he is, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, he's still doing great work and he hasn't let up. I'm sure that the bishop is just really frustrated by him. And I know that the bishop, even when before I left, he called Charlie the true enemy. And I was so disturbed by that because he's a member of his flock. He's a, he was a graduate of our Franciscan, uh, not Franciscan University, a Franciscan University, St. Bonaventure, um, and a, a, a really great guy who's, you know, his brother's in the seminary, but the bishop was vilifying him because he was just not able to accept that Charlie wasn't going anywhere. So he still is very much a reporter. Yeah, he's doing great work. So it's... Father James Martin thought he was going to 
get his LGBT movement up in, uh, but the Pope at the last minute turned him down. But, uh, I've been actively involved in that also. I've, I've had a, I'm, I'm with the Knights of Columbus. Mm -hmm. We lobbied against the gay marriage. And I got a poem here. Anybody like to read it? <laughs> what God's telling me. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Goes, oh say can you see, God has forsaken the LGBT. Storm Sandy, Florida Keys, oh say can you see. God has forsaken the LGBT. Puerto Rico, Houston, and Las Vegas, oh say can you see. California and the rainbow for Ellen DeGeneres isn't what you see. Oh say can you see, we better wake up and get rid of the liberals on the Supreme Court. Oh say can you see. How the prophet stand. Thank you. Thank you. Who has the next question? Yes. One more thing. I I understand, I don't know what territory this involves, but I understand it's been said like the priests are the only people in America that are guilty until proven innocent. That if a parish rectory gets a phone call and a pastor answers and someone says anything about any priest sexually involving anyone, the minute the phone is hung up, that priest is told to get out now. That, and I don't know how universal that is, mm -hmm. but, and then, you know, they have to be proven innocent. There's a group called Opus Bono Soccer Date, mm -hmm. and they, they take care of a lot of priests that are street people and stuff, you know, so. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I think, it, I was going to say, I think in our diocese, it wasn't quite that, dramatic or immediate, or at least the way I experienced it, there was more of a, a process that would take place at the chancery before the priest would be brought in. And um, it, in terms of what the charter demands, the threshold for proving that a claim is uh, not manifestly false or frivolous is a pretty low bar. Basically, it, it just has to be not obviously impossible. And usually we would go through three basic checks. One would be just the chronology. So is the time frame accurate? Was that priest even in that parish at that time? Then there would be kind of a geographic question. If the abuse happened at the parish, did the, the layout that the victim explained, did that match the geographic reality? And then also there's, there's photo proof too. So if the victim can describe the priest before seeing a photo, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it, the way I experienced it, it wasn't that immediate, you're out now. But when there was the administrative leave, uh, when it was determined that the, the claim had merit, then they would have to leave, um, usually uh, pretty quickly. It also depended, back home at least, on the parish itself. If the parish had a school attached to it, there was more urgency. Um, so, if, for instance, a lot of these priests last year were put on administrative leave during the summer months, so school wasn't in session. So if the priest needed a little bit more time to leave the rectory, he was given that. But I do remember there was one priest where they said, Father, you have to be out by August 15th because the kids are coming back. So there were some sort of specific circumstances, but I, I certainly understand what you're saying in terms of, you know, the, that the priest should, they, they have rights too, canonically and civilly. And there are also, we know, many abusers within public school system, within obviously media, politics. I mean, there's sadly abuse is in every aspect of society. Um, I think that because the abuse in the Catholic Church hasn't been handled well by our leadership, then people have taken that now where they are attacking the priests, which is obviously wrong. Um, but I think that sadly, the secular world looks for any way to attack our church. And this is a way that the devil has found that's very, very powerful. And, and there are some priests that may have had to suffer from, um, you know, an allegation that may have eventually been proved to be either mistaken identity or something of that nature. But I do also want to advocate for survivors that the ones I've encountered are not falsifying anything. And that's what's so tragic. I would love to tell you, oh, most of the claims are false, but they're not. And we have to deal with that reality while also supporting our good priests. But I can see the pain in your eyes when you talk about it, because I can tell you love our priests, and I do too. And I just hope that 
we can do both, mercy and justice. It's hard for us humans, but we can try. Let's take you 